Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, former Arizona Republic columnist John Talton joins us to discuss his new book on the history of Phoenix. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. John Talton is a former Arizona Republic columnist who now writes for the Seattle Times and edits and publishes the Rogue Columnist blog. John Talton is also an accomplished author of 12 critically acclaimed mystery novels, and he's just released a nonfiction book titled A Brief History of Phoenix. Here now is John Talton. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Good to I have you so here. I am so glad to be here. Oh, Thank it's, you. It's great to have you here. This book is, I just, I just love, I love stuff that puts Phoenix in context, looks at what was, not just what is, and what could be. The book, though, um, they describe the book, I think, on the back as America's improbable metropolis. You agree with that? Uh, sure. I mean, you put four million people uh, into this frying pan, uh, that's pretty improbable. And also, Phoenix was historically very isolated. It was not on a navigable river. It was not a port. Uh, it was blocked from the railroads initially by very high mountains to the east and to the north. And it didn't have gold. It didn't have copper. It had something very special that would be later discovered. But, the iso but isolation was one of Phoenix's historic enemies. You won't, won't believe that if you go to Sky Harbor now, but it was. Indeed, and it was, uh, I think the book also is, it describes uh, your story here as, as, as Phoenix as being one of American civilization's great accomplishments. Again, that makes sense to you? I absolutely believe that. We as a civilization have built this metropolis in a hostile environment where people can, without thinking, turn on the faucet, never wonder where the water comes from, they can live when it's 140 degrees on the sidewalk. They can travel around. They can have something that's called a lifestyle uh, that is a resort kind of a lifestyle. Um, and the cities are the great accomplishments of America. This one is very special. It is special. Let's talk about how it got started, at least as far as the, the Phoenix that we recognize. Who's Jack Swilling? Well, Jack Swilling for better or for worse, is credited as the founder of Phoenix. And I think that Swilling gets a bad rap in a lot of ways because he's not upright enough or he was a Confederate deserter or he was a drunkard. But Jack Swilling had a key insight. Jack Swilling saw the prehistoric Hohokam canals and the lay of the land that other travelers had seen but Swilling understood that it was ideal for agriculture. That what you have here is one of the great alluvial river valleys of the world where multiple rivers come together. The soil is incredibly rich. And as a result, this would be one of the great farm centers of America for decades. They called it American Eden. Well, indeed, and, and when Phoenix first got underway and the feds were looking out here, and, and, and obviously we'll talk a lot more about how much the feds look out here and how responsible the feds are for what we live in today, but they kind of saw Phoenix as a model for Jeffersonian farmers, didn't they? They did indeed. When Phoenix was uh, in the 1890s, it went through a terrible drought and the private water companies and canal companies went bankrupt. Uh, the farmers started to lose their crops and go away, and these were followed by terrible floods. We were lucky enough to get in at one of the first projects of the Newlands Reclamation Act in 1901. This built Theodore Roosevelt Dam. And as a consequence of this, the federal government wanted to get people out of the teeming evil cities of the east and onto these Jeffersonian farms of 160 acres on up. Uh, but people would be equal, people would be yeoman farmers, people would be friends of small d democracy, 
and they would learn all of the idealized virtues of farming. Now, my family came here in the 1890s, and I can tell you that farming is a lot harder than that. No kidding. But, you know, it, it, the book has a photograph of, I think, grape fields uh, in the shadow of Camelback Mountain. I mean, this is, I don't know where this exactly is, if it's somewhere near, I, I, who knows? But, I mean, you look at that and you go, goodness gracious, this was a farming mecca at one point. We, we grew everything here. All you, the soil is so rich, all you need to do is add water and you can grow everything. And, and Phoenix and the Salt River Valley fed much of America for decades. And the, uh, this was an accomplishment of the federal government through reclamation. It was an accomplishment of Phoenicians coming together to make this happen. Um, and it was an accomplishment of, of this wonderful place. I think you're right that uh, Theodore Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, really the dam was second to the Panama Canal as far as what he thought his accomplishments in office were. That's what he said. Isn't that something? I'm not surprised. And then the dam system that we built, uh, what we had that the Hohokam did not have was superior technology. And so we cleaned out the Hohokam canals, we built more, we built the dams. Uh, doesn't mean that we can go on forever this way, but what we did so far is an amazing accomplishment. Now also, uh, it, again, I believe I you remember you writing that this, what the reclamation in Phoenix and the idea of controlling these waters became kind of a template for the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA? Uh, well, it, remember that Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Theodore's cousin was very inspired by Theodore and so the uh, reclamation projects done under the first Roosevelt's administration would go on to inspire FDR during the New Deal as to what the federal government could do to reclaim and help areas. There are differences of course but yes it was an inspiration. And, and, and a big deal was allowing this new water system to help urban areas as well as agriculture, which was kind of new in and of itself, wasn't it? That was, that was an amazing little uh, slip of the pen that allowed urban areas to benefit from reclamation as well as farming. And so uh, Phoenix began to take off as a small town and then a small city. Indeed, a small city, but it was a dense and kind of diverse city early on, wasn't it? Oh, up into 1950, the city itself had only about 17 square miles. And everything that you hear today about new urbanism, about, about walkability and every uh, eight steps, there was a new store to be seen. I saw this in my lifetime when I was a boy. And the trains came into Union Station. And, uh, but then annexation took the city out further and further because the uh, City Fathers uh, wanted to not get hemmed in like a St. Louis or a Columbus or a Cincinnati uh, and with suburbs all around them. This is what they were thinking at the time in, yes. in the late 50s and the 60s. And so they embarked on an incredibly ambitious annexation effort. So in 1950, Phoenix enters the 100 top cities at number 99, about 105,000 people. By 1960, it's about 27 or 28 at 431,000, and part of that was immigration, but part of it also was annexation because Phoenix did very ambitious annexation. Uh, let's get back now to the earlier days, though. Uh, the City Beautiful movement, what was that, and how did it impact Phoenix in the 1920s? Well, the City Beautiful movement was an urban design movement meant to complement pedestrians and help pedestrians and autos navigate the same space together and it was what it intended to be to make cities beautiful and so if you go to Portland Street today between Third Avenue and Central you'll see a parkway and in the parkway are fountains and trees and grass and on both sides are apartments there used to be two of those before the freeway. Those were built in the City Beautiful movement as a way of, of making this urban environment a beautiful place. Uh, Phoenix isn't 
the best example of City Beautiful, but for a small city of the time, we got a number of things like that. The uh, 30s, obviously the Depression, FDR, the projects, how much did they bail out Arizona? Oh, they bailed us out enormously. Arizona probably benefited more per capita than any other state from the New Deal, uh, and Phoenix especially. Uh, remember, back in those days, Arizona was a reliable democratic state, and FDR campaigned here, um, and he was uh, elected wholeheartedly by Arizonans, and especially Phoenicians, because remember there was living memory of Theodore Roosevelt and the reclamation projects that saved this city and saved the Salt River Valley. And so in everything from building North High and uh, the Desert Botanical Garden and Papago Park and things like that, and, and the Botanical Garden was also a private effort, but uh, roads, uh, bridges, canals, the New Deal, uh, spent tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. It would be much more of that in sure. real money today. Uh, saving Phoenix from a terrible fate because we had our Hoovervilles. We had one of the worst slums in America. And Phoenix was hit very hard by the Depression early on, a lot harder than than the local myth has it. As, as much of the country, uh, though, uh, when World War II hit, uh, that seemed to get things moving. I know that uh, military bases out here west of town, very important during where Patton trained out here. He did. We were very uh, fortunate to get a number of Army Air Forces training bases uh, really all around the city, uh, everything from uh, Falcon Field to the east around Mesa uh, to the different Thunderbird fields uh, that are, one is now the Scottsdale Air Park, uh, and these trained uh, pilots, but Patton trained in desert warfare about 100 miles to the west of here, and a lot of the troops were bivou bivouacked here. Interesting. Now, after World War II, I think a lot of folks figured that was when Arizona in general, Phoenix in particular, really took off. But did we take off like other regions of the country? We actually didn't, and this is one of the interesting discoveries I made in my research. Uh, we were not prepared. Uh, the city leaders were not prepared for the sudden drop-off of defense contracts, defense work, industries that had lo been located inland for safety. All that went away, and it went away suddenly, and Phoenix went into this little mini-recession, and a lot of people feared there would be a depression. Uh, more people had come here, but the large migration that followed had not really taken up. So. In the late 40s, Phoenix leaders had to really step up and recruit new kinds of industries and get the city beyond just agriculture and just real estate. It also had to, these leaders had to sell a lifestyle, didn't they? We've got a shot of some people hanging around near a pool. I mean, this could be yesterday at some apartment complex here in town. But um, the idea of the sun and the good life and these folks, they're just having a great old time. You really had to sell that, didn't you? Well, you had to have it first. Yeah, there you and go. And that meant air conditioning. Phoenix was actually one of the major centers of air conditioning construction and manufacturing in the United States. And because of air conditioning being affordable for a single family house, suddenly in the years after World War II, you could have this lifestyle marketed all across the country come here in Phoenix, even in the hot months, you'll be cool, you'll have a pool in the backyard. Yeah, um, you mentioned air, now did air conditioning, was it developed here, or was it early development here? It was not developed here, and it, it goes back. I mean, we had refrigeration in the movie theaters starting in the 1920s, and in okay. some of the high-end hotels like the Westward Ho uh, and the San Carlos, but it was, uh, and then we had swamp coolers. Um, but after World War II, the technology became available to make these uh, central air units that were affordable enough for a single family house. And it was revolutionary, uh, especially for Phoenix, but oh, yeah. all cities in the South and Southwest. And we manufactured a tremendous number of air conditioning units here. We had several companies that set up shop here. 
because why export the things here if you can just make them here? Indeed. And so you got your air conditioning and set. You got the salesman saying, come on out here. We've got lifestyle. You saw those people sitting by the pool. They're having a good time. This could be you. You got to house them. Enter someone like Adele Webb. Who is Adele Webb? Dell Webb was one of the most uh, influential contractors in American history, and he was a, a Phoenician. Uh, Dell Webb got rich off of the New Deal, off of contracts for building things uh, with, with the New Deal, and then with World War II, and sadly that includes a Japanese internment camp. After the war, Webb uh, built all up and down North Central, like the Phoenix Towers, the pink towers, that kind of Bauhausy thing around Cyprus and Central. That was Del Webb. He went on to uh, build Sun City, and then the other huge influence was John F. Long yes. and Maryvale. Maryvale. Talk about Maryvale, because we think of Maryvale in some ways now, but as you can see from this, uh, Maryvale was the future at one time. Well, it was. I remember that we lived in this old 1924 Spanish colonial fallen down in what is now Willow, and my uncle bought a house in Maryville from John Long, and he had an all-electric kitchen and a carport and a pool in the back, and I was so envious. <laughs> he had cinder block walls, uh, but seriously, the uh, Maryville was Phoenix's first large-scale automobile subdivision rather like Levittown back east, but John F. Long made a lot of innovations himself uh, in distinctive construction types and in making costs affordable, including to GIs, especially Anglo GIs. And um, so the people who were coming here uh, had that kind of an option uh, to to live in a place where you've got a lawn, you've got trees, you've got a pool, things that you never thought you could afford in the Depression. Now you can afford them. And uh, come they did, 60s, 70s, 80s, just explosive population growth. I mean, we, we you talked about us being a top 100 city. I mean, it got to the point where we were top 50, top 20. I mean, at one point here not too long ago, we were top six or five or whatever it is, uh, did we lose our, did, did Phoenix, and we're talking about Phoenix here, did Phoenix lose its character? Did Phoenix lose what, what made it unique? It did to a great degree because Phoenix used to be very much an oasis with a lot of shade and a lot of green and it was surrounded by agriculture, the Japanese gardens along Baseline Road and citrus groves and horses and uh, farm fields, uh, we exported food all over the country, uh, and we had a, a relatively compact city with downtown and midtown. Um, in the 70s and 80s, midtown was hopping. We mm -hmm. had our own Playboy Club, uh, and so Phoenix had a very distinctive character. And a good deal of that has been lost, although it's still there, and that's one reason I wrote this, is so people understand this place has a history and this place has a soul. I, I know, but uh, a social scientist, Andrew Ross, I think you quote him in the book, he said that Phoenix has overshot its carrying capacity. Do you agree with that? I think there's a risk of that, and what Ross means is in a world of climate change, and the effects that it will have, including on our, our renewable water supply, which is the snow melt in the mountains. Uh, how many people can Phoenix sustain, and especially how many people can Phoenix sustain in single family house sprawl? Now that's the big debate that's been going on since I was writing at the Arizona Republic. It hasn't been settled. It has been paused, but mostly by the Great Recession. Yeah, and also, uh, I think you mentioned in the book as well, we could be top five in population. It kind of comes and goes. Philadelphia and Phoenix seem like they switch around a little bit here. But you could be top five in population, but what about the top five economy? What about a top five education system? I mean, what about a top five in terms of arts and culture? Are we anywhere close? No, we're not. And I say that with no pleasure. but. We have a long way to go in, in those areas, and for a complex set of reasons, we did not keep up with the business recruitment that 
began in the late 40s and reached its uh, apogee in the late 60s when we won Greyhound from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And we thought that would be the start of a bunch of Fortune 500 headquarters coming right here to Central Phoenix. Uh, we have far fewer universities than any city of this size or even less. We don't have the kind of diverse economy that we need with the high wage jobs. Uh, the leaders know this, is just digging out of this hole and working uh, to make the proper investments is where the debate is. And yet, uh, last point here, you write that optimism is the ruling emotion for most Phoenicians. Do you still think that's the case? I do. I think that there was a Morrison Institute poll done maybe 15 or 16 years ago that said that uh, this very large percentage of people, if they had a choice, would leave Phoenix. But we have a lot of population churn. By and large, the people who come here and stay here even for a while are optimists. And they do see history as a rising road because they can reinvent themselves in a place like this. And if they understand the history better, they can understand the challenges better, and Phoenix has a future assured. Well, you can certainly understand the history with your new book, A Brief History of Phoenix. John Talton, good to have you here. Great discussion. Thanks My so much pleasure. for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about a research effort to enrich and deliver CO2 to help cultivate microalgae and bring down the price of algae-based biofuels. That's at 530 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.